So this video is on the chemistry higher level paper one specimen paper of the International Baccalaureate. This is paper one, it consists of 40 marks. So in question one, it says which changes of state are endothermic processes? So remember, endothermic is when bonds are broken. Exothermic processes are when bonds are made. So let's consider condensing. Condensing is going from a gas to a liquid. So therefore, in a gas, there's not many bonds. Therefore, you are making more bonds going into a liquid. Therefore, this would be considered an exothermic process. Melting is solid to liquid. So therefore, you are reducing the number of bonds. And subliming is solid to gas, again reducing the number of bonds. So therefore, both of these two are endothermic processes, giving us an answer for C. So to answer question two, we've got to balance this equation using the uh, smallest possible whole numbers. Let's start. So one method is to write a line where the arrow is, and then write the uh, nitrogen, oxygen, the elements on the left and on the right-hand side, and then count them up. So let's count up the left-hand side. So we can see on the left hand side we've got one nitrogen, two oxygens and three hydrogens and on the right hand side two hydrogens, one oxygen and two hydrogens. Uh, best thing to start with is the element which is in the most things, it's not on its own. So you see oxygen and nitrogen are on their own so they're great to do last, they're very easy to balance. So we'll deal with the hydrogen first. So on the left hand side we've got three, on the right hand side we've got two. So what's a common factor? What do um, three and two both go into? So they both go into 6. So how can we turn that into 6? Well, we can times it by 2. So if we put a large 2 here, we've now got 6 hydrogens here. And if we put a large 3 here, we've now got 6 hydrogens over here. This, of course, changes the nitrogen. So now we've got 2 nitrogens. And it, of course, changes the oxygen. We've now got 3 oxygens. So nitrogen is now very handily balanced already. Oxygen is still not balanced. We've got two and three. So we've got to use whole numbers only because we could put a one and a half there, but we've got to use whole numbers. That's generally for you know for a proper equation. We don't we don't want halves unless it's some sort of thermodynamic definition equation, in which case we do. But generally we want whole numbers. So again, two and three go into six. So let's put a three. So now we've got six. So, we need to now get six oxygens over here. So, how can we get six oxygens? Well, we have three already, so let's change this into a six. Now we have six oxygens. That's obviously going to change the number of hydrogens. We've now got 12 hydrogens. So, how can we get 12 hydrogens on the left hand side? Or we need to double up or um, put a four here. So, that changes that to 12, which gives us more nitrogens. So now we've got four nitrogens, two on the other side. So if we just put a two here, we are now sorted. So let's add all these all up. So we've got six coefficient here, two here, three here, four here. So four plus three plus two plus six is 15. And there's our answer. So question three, we've got five grams of calcium carbonate. So calcium carbonate, which when heated, so you can see it's firmly decomposing into calcium oxygen oxide even and carbon dioxide. We get 2.4 grams of calcium oxide, which is the correct expression for the percentage yield of calcium oxide. And it's giving us the MRs. So we've got the equation we need, which is percentage yield. is experimental yield over theoretical yield times 100. So let's have a look. So we've got something that looks like this. We've got the experimental yield, which is 2.40 uh, times 100 divided by the theoretical yield. So what's the theoretical yield? Well... We can we can look use um, moles to work to sort of get a sort of thing for that. So our moles of our calcium carbonate is going to be our mass over our mR. Let's put that there, and that's going to equal five over a hundred. So five grams over the mR, which is a uh, hundred. And our moles of calcium carbonate is going to equal the same as our moles of calcium oxide. Can you see there's a one-to-one -one ratio there? So the moles of the calcium uh, oxide also equals this. So that's the moles of the calcium oxide, 5 over 100. So our mass of our calcium oxide is going to equal the moles of the calcium oxide times its MR. So that's going to equal 5.00 over 100 times 56. 
So if we throw that into our equation over here, we get something that looks like this. So what I've done is substitute theoretical yield for this uh, black working out here for the mass of the calcium oxide, theoretical yield. And now we've just got to do a little bit of maths to rearrange this to get this to looking like one of these equations. So the first bit of maths we can do is, well, if you are... If you've got something which is being divided by something else and then being divided again, well, we can throw that on top. So all I've done is taken that divided by 100 and thrown it on top because it's the same. So we've got 2.40 times 100 times 100 divided by 5.00 times 56, which is the same as B. So B must be our answer. So this question is asking which electron transition would absorb the radiation of the shortest wavelength? So think about shortest wavelength, what sort of energy frequency are we looking at? So generally things with short wavelength are going to be things with high frequency. So we're looking at, um, in terms of, uh, we're looking at um, the ultraviolet side of the electromagnetic spectrum. So it's got a, a short wavelength, high energy. So which one, which first, which of these are absorbing energy? So you see an electron here for A, the electron's going down, so that's actually... Uh, transmit, um, emitting energy. The same for C, it's going to be emitting energy, and it's been coming out. Whereas B and D, energy is coming in to promote the electron to the higher energy level. Again, for D. So which one, B or D? Well, D is going a very short distance, so therefore it's not absorbing much energy, therefore it's probably absorbing wave, a wavelength with a, a large wavelength, something on the infrared side of the spectrum of the electromagnetic um, electromagnetic spectrum. So B is our most likely candidate. Question says, 5 says, which is the electronic configuration of the iron 2 plus? So think about iron. If we draw out the iron as, it's, as it is without being charged, the electronic configuration of iron is the 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d6, oops, that's not, no, 3d6, 4s2, yes, yes. So we're removing electrons. So electrons um, are removed from the 4s before the 3d because the 4s is actually becomes a higher energy level. So we're removing two electrons. So let's go remove those. So that's what we're left with. If we have two electrons removed, we're left with 3d6. So therefore, our answer is A. So these sort of ionisation questions come up quite a lot where they sort of ask you to guess. They show you a bunch of first, second, third, fourth ionisation data and guess, ask you to guess the group or the element. They might tell you um, the, the um, period and then ask you what element it is. So we're looking for big jumps. There's an easy way of doing this. Basically, um, if you're looking for an element in group two, then you're going to have a big jump on the third ionisation. Why is this? Let's draw a group two element. So let's draw uh, magnesium, for example. So magnesium looks like this. Okay, I'm not going to draw the inner shells, but in its outer shells, it's got two electrons in its outermost shell. So the energy required to remove this one, not too much. Energy required to move this one more because you're now removing it from a one positive ion. Now think about the third ionization. So the third ionization is going to be removing an electron from one of these, uh, from the shell inside here. So there's going to be a big, big jump from removing, this was the second one we removed, and the third one. Why is that? Well, it's much closer to the nucleus, um, so you've got less shielding, you've got bigger, closer to the, being the positive nucleus, there's a greater electrostatic attraction. So where have we got a big jump between second and third? So you can see big jump here, um, small jump, small jump. So the biggest jump that I can see is this one, so this suggests this is a group 2 element. So we could also look at the other ones if they asked us, I mean, what element do you think this one is? Well, there's a big jump here, so that suggests this is in group 3, this element. So, um, well, if you're laughing, if you get a question like this, so which element's in the F block? Well, look on your periodic table, and you will see that this element is in the F block. So another easy question, um, so what's, which property increases down group 1 of the periodic table? Well, melting point actually uh, decreases as we go down group 1. I mean, it increases as you go up group 1 because the metals are getting smaller, therefore there is less distance between their nucleus and their delocalized electrons, which holds metals together in group 1. First, ionization energy also is going to decrease. It increases going up the group 
again because as you go up the group you've got um, again a shorter distance between the outermost electron and the nucleus and also less shielding. Atomic radius will actually, this is the correct answer because it will increase. You think as you go down the period, down the group even, you're adding shells of electrons, therefore the atomic radius will increase. Electronegativity, again, this one goes down, again, because electronegativity is the um, ability of uh, an atom to um, attract a pair of electrons in a covalent bond towards itself. And that's all to do with, again, the, how the distance between the nucleus and those pair of covalently bonded electrons. So if you have a small atom, again, it's going to have a short distance and less shielding between the nucleus and the, um, and the uh, electrons. Okay, so iron 2 has a 2 positive charge. These guys have a 1 negative charge, but there's 6 of them, so times that by 6. So we've got 2 positive, 6 negative gives us 4 negative. So which statement about transition metal complexes is correct? The difference in energy of the d orbitals is independent of the oxidation state of the metal. Well, no, we know that oxidation states, different oxidation states affect the difference in the energy of the d orbitals, hence they affect the colour. The colour of the complex is caused by light emitted when an electron falls back from a higher to a lower energy level. Ah, so this bit is again incorrect. It's not the light emitted, it's the light which is not absorbed, it's the light reflected which gives them the colour. So it's the light which is not absorbed by the electron going being promoted from a lower to a higher energy level. The colour of the complex is the colour of the light absorbed when the electron moves from a lower to a higher energy level. Again, we just talked about this, it's not the colour due to the light absorbed, it's the colour reflected. The difference in, the, in energy of d orbitals depends on the nature of the ligand. This is the bit which is, uh, which is correct. So definitely the difference in energy of the d orbitals does depend on the nature of the ligand. So different ligands can cause different energy gaps, hence different colours. So again, a very nice, easy question. What is the best description of ionic bonding? It's the electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged ions. Uh, it's definitely not the attraction between ions and electrons. That's metallic bonding. Uh, electrostatic attraction of nuclei towards shared electrons. That's covalent bonding. Electrostatic attraction between nuclei. Uh, well, that wouldn't happen because nuclei have positive charges. So that's the answers to those two. Ah. So this question is asking us which intermolecular forces are covered by the van der Waal forces. Well, that would be all of them. Van der Waal forces are all of them. So D. Okay, so this question here is asking us which bond is the least polar. So we're comparing electronegativity. We haven't been given electronegativity, but we know that things which are far apart on the um, periodic table have a high difference in electronegativity. So carbon and oxygen are relatively far apart. I mean, oxygen is especially electronegative, carbon not especially. So therefore, that's very polar. Again, chlor carbon and chlorine. Chlorine is very electronegative, so very polar. Nitrogen, again, you know, this is in a has hydrogen bonding, very, very polar. Carbon and hydrogen, it is a t there is a difference. It's not zero, but it's very, very, it's um, considered almost non-polar. It's uh, the least polar, definitely. So this is an interesting question. Which pair of compounds contain nine sigma and two pi bonds in each molecule? So remember, pi bonds are what we get with double bonds. So we're looking for nine single bonds and two double bonds. So let's have a look here. We've got three single bonds between the carbon and the hydrogen, a single bond between the carbon and the carbon. And this looks like um, a carboxylic acid, so you're going to have a double bond between the carbon and the oxygen and the single bonds. So not enough double bonds, so that rules out A. Okay. Uh, B, let's look at B. So we've got uh, some single bonds. We've got, uh, this looks like a ketone, so a double bond between the carbon and the oxygen, but just again, just one double bond, so that rules out B. Okay, let's look at C. So C, we've got a single bond between the carbon and the hydrogen. Notice how there's no more hydrogens here, so there must be a double bond between these two carbons. Um, actually, a triple bond, actually. A triple bond between these two carbons here. Let's draw it out. So if we draw it out, we can see that we've got this triple bond here, so two pi bonds there. 
So counting the sigma bonds, we've got one there, one in there, next to the two pi bonds. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this is a good so far, this one here. Let's draw this one out here. So this one is this one here. And we can see we've got, you can see the two hydrogens there. So it means there must be a double bond there. Uh, again, the same thing, must be a double bond there, which means that must be a single bond. So again, we've got two pi bonds, one there, one there. Let's count the sigma bonds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So therefore, answer must be C. So question 9 to 15, which molecule contains an atom with sp2 hybridization? So the sp2 hybridization is when we have double bonds. It's formed from the s uh, electrons in s orbital and two electrons in p orbitals. So we're looking for double bonds. So none there. We can see just single bonds. We've got a triple bond here between um, a nitrogen, but that wouldn't be sp2. Again, no double bonds there. Uh, here we've got a double bond. Can you see between this carbon here, this carbon here has got just one hydrogen, so is this. That tells us there must be a double bond between those two carbons. Therefore, they will both have sp2 hybridization. Oops. Okay, we've got a thermodynamics question. So when you've got 0 0.46 grams of ethanol, so the ethanol is there, is burnt, under a water-filled calorimeter, the temperature of 500 grams of water, so the water's in there, is raised by 3 Kelvin, and it tells us the molar mass of the ethanol, 46 grams per mole, specific heat capacity of water, 4.18 joules per gram per Kelvin, and it gives us the formula Q equals mc delta t. And then the question is, what is the expression of the enthalpy of combustion? So let's work it out. So we're going to need these two equations. We can need Q equals mc delta t and delta hc over equals Q over moles. And we're trying to work out delta hc by combining them together. So first, let's fill in this. So m is the mass of the water. So that's 500 grams. C is our specific heat capacity, 4.18. And delta t is our change in, temp in Kelvin. So let's put those numbers in and work out a value for Q. Or let's not work out a value for Q because it looks like we just need to find the expression. So here we go, we've got, this is Q, 500 times 4.18 times 3. So throwing that over here, we've got delta HC, which is 500 times 4.18 times 3, and we need to work out moles. So we've got moles equals mass over MR, so the mass of um, the ethanol, which was burnt, that's over there, that's a 0 0.46, oops, and that's over its MR, which is 46, nice easy numbers. So again, let's combine these equations, and again, we can see we've got the same situation as last time, where we're going to have 0 0.46 divided by 46, so we can throw the 46 and actually times it, we can put the 46 on top. So here we go, putting that mole equation in here, and all we've got to do is just throw that 46 on top, and it should look one of, like one of these equations down here. Okay, awesome. So almost finished. We've got 46 over there. And we've got to remember that obviously that uh, delta H is in kilojoules, um, whereas Q is worked out, always comes out in joules. So we just need to divide our Q value by 1,000. So I'll just put a divide by 1,000. Let's do that in yellow. So let's divide it by 1,000, which is the same as times in this bottom by 1,000. Okay, and wh which ones does this look like? Let's have a look. Oh, and obviously, obviously, we can see that this is the FNL is burnt and the temperature raised, so we know this is an exothermic reaction. So this value, we always put the sign on last. The sign is not worked out mathematically. So because this is exothermic, all these values are going to be negative, so it's going to be minus. And it looks like C, so C is our answer. Here. Okay, so this question here says, given the following information, what is the standard enthalpy uh, or formation of methane? And it gives us a load of equations. Uh, and then we've got to work out which sort of combination of them is the formation of methane. So a good idea might be to write out an enthalpy cycle for the formation of methane and see how these sort of fit into that. So here's the equation for the formation of methane. So we're forming one mole of methane because the enthalpy change of formation is the enthalpy change when one mole of a substance is formed from its constituent elements in their standard state. So notice how they're in all in their standard states. 
Okay, and now what we do is we start add on equations. So let's add equation one. So equation one has some carbon. We've got carbon there already. Can you see how the arrow is going from carbon away towards something else? So let's add that in. So I'll add that in in blue. We can see it's going from the carbon towards carbon dioxide gas. And we're going to need some oxygen to do that. So we're allowed to do that. We can add oxygen. So let's add O2. But remember, we must add it on to the other side because you, whatever elements you have, you must have in all the different parts of the uh, cycle. Okay, so we've got some oxygen gas on either side. And we can call this arrow, or part of this arrow is positive E. It's positive E. Okay, let's go on, move on to the next equation. So equation two, that's that one there. So you've got some hydrogen. Well, where have we got hydrogen? Again, we've got hydrogen, adding oxygen, going towards water. So again, that's the same, that's the same blue arrow. So all we've got to do is add some water down here. And we can see this arrow is now E plus F. Well, it's actually plus 2F because you can see how uh, this F is when one hydrogen, when one hydrogen molecule, let's remove that too, that's a bit confusing, um, when one hydrogen molecule reacts with some oxygen forming one molecule of water. And we've got two hydrogen molecules over here, so therefore this is going to be 2F. Okay, now let's add the third equation. The third equation's got methane and oxygen. So where have we got methane? We've got methane here, and it's going towards some carbon dioxide and some water. So we need to go towards, that means the arrow is going away from the carbon dioxide and towards, sorry, away from the methane towards the carbon dioxide and the water like this. And this is just one mole, so this is G. Now let's just balance this. I mean, we're balancing the hydrogen first. We've got four hydrogens there. And we've got uh, just two down there, so let's put a two down here. So we've now balanced the hydrogen, we've balanced the carbon, let's just balance the oxygen, so we need four oxygens, so a two there and a two there. Anyway, so going back to the question, um, so we've got this enthalpy change here is equivalent to going down this arrow and up this arrow, so it's going positive E, positive 2F, you know, going down here, we've got to here, and then we're going the opposite way up here, so we're going negative G. So it's E plus 2F, negative G. Okay, let's look at this next question. So, question 18. Which combination has the most endothermic lattice enthalpy? So, factors considered. To consider, we've got the radius of the positive ion, the radius of the negative ion, charge on the positive ion, charge on the negative ion. So, obviously... Uh, to have a really big endothermic lattice enthalpy, we want to have a high positive charge and a high negative charge. So that sort of rules out B and C with their ones. So we're sort of looking between A and D already. And then we look at the sort of radius, and we can see the radiuses of the positive ions are the same, but the radius of the negative ion is much larger for A. Now we actually want small radius for this negative ion, because if you think about it, the smaller it is with the same charge, this one's going to have a greater charge density. So this two negative charge is going to be spread over a smaller area, hence it's going to be more dense, hence the, they can get closer together and it will be more strongly attracted, therefore we'll have a greater endothermic lattice enthalpy. Okay, question 19, in which reaction is the value of delta S positive? So delta S is entropy, so we're looking for entropy. So entropy increases when you get more uh, particles. So for example, getting a gas, so there's definitely a positive entropy reaction going on here, thermal decomposition. Uh, this one here, you can see gas to solid. Entropy is actually decreasing. We're having less chaos and less disorder here. Um, remember, entropy is the sort of num way, number of ways you can arrange particles. So you can arrange a gas in so many different ways, but a solid, regular arrangement less. So this is a negative ent um, entropy change. Here we've got some aqueous stuff turning into a more, well, less moles of aqueous stuff and solid again. So a negative entropy change, less chaos, more order. And over here we've got uh, three gases turning into two gases again, so less chaos, so again negative. So these are all negative entropy change, but this one is a positive entropy change. Let's circle that. So this question says, which graph shows the Maxwell-Boltzmann energy distribution of a same amount of a gas at two temperatures where T2 is greater than T1? So when, T, when a temperature is greater, what happens to the curve is it shifts um, to the right, 
and the tip will get lower down. So we're looking for a T2 which is lower down, which is actually I'll just this one. Um, also, the um, so it gets shifted to the right. So this one gets shifted to the right. This one doesn't. This one. Uh, it's about the same. So the reason it gets shifted to the right is because when you have a greater temperature, you've got more energy. So therefore, you're going to have more particles with more energy. Hence, that's why it shifts to the right. And the most probable energy, that is the oops, that's the peak, gets shifted to the right and gets lower. The reason this is because is if you as we are um, increasing the energy, there's a greater range of energies because there's a greater range of energies compared to T1, therefore there is less particles with the most probable energy, and the highest point is the most probable energy. So less particles, that's why it gets lower. And remember, the actual, this is not the average energy, the average energy is actually going to be somewhere around here, it's the most probable energy. So it's going to be C for our answer here, so C is our answer. So... Kinetics question. So which changes increases the rate of this reaction? Other conditions remain constant. So using larger lumps of calcium carbonate, well, if we've got larger lumps, there's less area, less sort of surface area available for the acid to react. So that will slow the reaction down. Remember, we want increased surface area for solids for a faster reaction. Increasing the temperature, but yet yeah, temperature is always going to increase kinetics. Uh, so that's good. Increasing concentration, again, brilliant. We've got more concentration, more chance of collisions, therefore more chance of successful collisions. So both these guys, that means gives us C, are going to increase the rate of the reaction. So this is a rate question. So the rate information below was obtained for the following reaction at a constant temperature. Okay, so we've got some different rates of reactions with different concentrations of the reactants. So we've got to work out the... Um, orders with respect to each of the different reactants and then work out the overall order. So we've got the following equation, rate equals K and that's times the concentration of the hydrogen peroxide to the power X and then we've got times the H plus to the power Y and the I minus to the power Z. So we've got to work out X, Y and Z and then add them together to give us the overall order. So let's work out X. So we're looking for a situation where the hydrogen peroxide concentration has changed, so between these two experiments, let's give them some numbers, so we'll call this experiment 1, 2, 3, and 4. So we're comparing experiments 1 and 2 because this has changed, and these have remained constant. So the only thing that changed was the concentration of hydrogen peroxide. You can see that it has doubled, so this is doubled times by 2. And what's happened to the rate? Well, we can see that the rate has also doubled, so therefore... If the concentration doubled causes the rate to double, we know that at x must equal 1. It must be first order, because if a, in a first order, for a first order reactant, uh, if you double its concentration, the rate will double. So x equals 1. Okay, let's now move on and try and work out y. So again, we're looking for a situation where y has ch h plus has changed. We can see here, again, it has doubled. And again, stay the same, stay the same. Oh, look, no change here. So the rate has not been affected. So if we double its concentration, but it doesn't change the rate, that means Y does not affect um, the rate. So therefore, it's zero order. So Y equals zero. Now let's look at Z. So Z, so AI minus. So we're trying to find a situation. Okay, this is a nice one. We can see how that's the same. So between experiments two and three, you can see it's uh, doubled times by two. And again, those haven't changed, those haven't changed. We wouldn't want to use experiments um, 2 and 4, for instance, because H plus has also changed. You want the other two reactants to be uh, remain the same, so if possible. Um, so, in this situation, it's doubled. You can see the rate has also doubled. Therefore, Z equals 2. Sorry, not 2. And Z equals 1. It's first order again. So, therefore, 1 plus 1 is Two, so the answer must be C. Um, you do get a lot more difficult questions on this, where they sort of, where you do have to uh, situations where two or more things change, and you have to actually use these equations. Um, but I've done a different video on that. Please have a look if you're interested, because I don't want to, no time to go into it, because it's very quite complex. So this question says, which reaction is most likely to be spontaneous? So a really good um, way of doing this, if you haven't memorized them, is to draw out the equation. 
So we've got the equation delta G, so it gives free energy equals delta H, the enthalpy change, minus T times delta S. So let's think which one is likely to be spontaneous. Therefore, we want delta G, we want this to be negative. So what's going to cause this to be negative, um, which is most likely to be caused to be negative? So therefore, we want this to be a negative number. Because this is, this is a negative number, then this is likely to be negative. What do we want delta S to be? Well, we want delta S to be a positive number, because... If this is a positive number, it's going to be minus, so it's going to turn into a negative number. So therefore, if delta H is negative and delta S is positive, we will get always get a very negative delta G. So let's have a look. So we want delta H negative, that means exothermic, so we're looking at these two. And delta S we want positive, so positive is when entropy increases, so the answer is B. So which conditions give the greatest equilibrium yield of methanol? So methanol, we can see, is on the right-hand side. We can see it's an exothermic reaction in the forward direction, therefore endothermic in the backward direction. And we can see we've got two moles of gas on the left and one mole on the right. So therefore, two moles, if we increase the pressure, the equilibrium will shift to the side with the fewest number of gaseous moles. So it will shift to that side. So we want a high pressure. So we want these ones, high pressure. And then for temperature, we want it to go in the exothermic direction, which means we actually want to have a low temperature. Because if we have a low temperature, the equilibrium will shift to oppose our change. So if we have a low temperature, the equilibrium will shift in the direction which produces more heat to replace the lost, lost uh, temperature. So therefore it will shift in the forward direction. So we want it as a low temperature, so we want A. So in this next question, it's asking us which combination of temperature and equilibrium constant is most typical of a reaction going to completion. So for a reaction going to complete completion, to fully sort of reacting, we want delta G to be as negative as possible. So we want this whole stuff to equal a very positive number, R times T times ln K, and it all gets minus, so therefore it will become a very big negative number. So we want high R, well R, R is a constant, that's just 8.31, but high T and a high LNK. So temperature, we want high, so definitely A or B. And then we want a high, a big K, so again, greater than 1, so A is our answer. So this question asks, which of the following is not amphiprotic? So amphiprotic is when something, a particle can... Uh, donate or accept a proton. So water is good at this. Water can um, donate an H+, plus forming OH- minus ions, or it can take an H+, plus forming the hydronium ion. You can see it over here. So that definitely is amphoteric. Um, you can see this. It's got an H+, plus to donate. You can see how it's got a negative charge. It's very likely to gain an H+, plus, so definitely amphoteric. Same goes for this one here. Now this um, hydronium ion, you can see it's got a positive charge. So the odds of another H+, plus another positive charge coming, a thing, coming along and reacting with it, it's just not likely. I mean, where are the electrons going to be for the double bond? Um, so this is just not, it cannot gain another proton, but it very easily can lose it. It definitely is acidic, so this is the answer. Okay, this question says, the pH of a solution changes from 3 to 5. What happens to the concentration of hydrogen ions? So we're getting less acidic, so it's obviously going to be less hydrogen ions, so we're looking at decrease. Okay, decrease in hydrogen is getting less acidic. Um, think about it. So, what's the difference between a pH of 3 and 4? Well, it's a logarithmic scale, so there's a difference of multiple of 10. So, what's the difference between 3 and 5? Well, it's 10, another times 10, so therefore times 100, so the answer is D. If you're confused by what logarithmic scale means, and just logs in general, um, Please go and sort this out. Uh, I'll try to make, make a video about it at some point, but I haven't got time to go into it now because it will okay, take a bit of time. Okay, just a simple bit of recall. So which statement is correct about a Lewis base? So if you remember, a Lewis base is a substance which donates a pair of electrons. So therefore, we're looking at uh, either A, because it's donating a pair of electrons, electron pair donor, or C, Electron pair acceptor would be a Lewis acid. And then we've got to think, so can it act as a nucleophile or an electrophile? Well, think what a nucleophile does. Think about a common nucleophile you probably looked at is OH- or CN 
minus or ammonia. Well, what's all common about all these things? Well, they've all got lone pairs of electrons. So therefore, this makes sense that it must be A because it's got a lone pair of electrons which, which it donates. Therefore, it's also a nucleophile. So this question asks, which mixture forms a buffer solution with a pH of less than 7? So less than 7, that's going to be acidic. So we need something where the acid is in excess. Can you see here we've got some ammonium chloride salt, which can also act as an acid, and some ammonia, but there's equal amounts of it. So they're just going to neutralize and going to get a pH of 7. Um, here we've got some HCl, so strong acid, ammonia, weak base. But we've got lots of weak base. There's more weak base. Can you see how there's 50 cm cubed more of the ammonia, which means they're going to neutralize. There'll be no acid left, and then there'll be 50 cm cubed of the ammonia left. So that's going to have a pH of greater than 7. Uh, so st sodium hydroxide, strong base with uh, ethanoic acid, weak acid. So this one, we can see how the acid is in excess this time. It's in excess by 50. So it could be C. Let's just have a look at D. So uh, D... We've got, what's that, H2SO4, so that's a um, sulfuric acid, a strong acid with a weak base. Again, the base is in excess. Oh, this is diprotic, so actually this has got two H's, so this, is, this would actually completely neutralise again a pH of 7. So the only option really is here, we don't really need to do any maths, just, just looking at it, you can see how the acid is 50 cm cubed in excess. They've got the same concentration, that means this has literally got double the number of particles. So it's an interesting question. So the equations below represent reactions involved in the Winkler method for determining the concentration of dissolved oxygen in the water. So we can see we've got oxygen reacting with the manganese hydroxide, making this, okay, and then this further reacts, okay, further reacts, turning this iodide ion into iodine, and then the iodine reacts with this thiosulfate. And the question is sort of talking about the thiosulfate and the iodine and then linking it back to the oxygen. It says, what is the amount in moles of thiosulfur ions needed to react with the iodine formed by one mole of dissolved oxygen? So we've got to use molar ratios and go between equations to work out how many moles of thiosulfur ions we need. So let's do it. So we've got one mole of the oxygen, which is going to make two moles of this. Okay. Right, so we've got two moles of this. So that's going to make 2 moles of this and 6 moles of this. So we've got 2 moles of this and it's going to make 2 moles of this. So therefore we've got 2 moles of this, Oops. 2 moles of the iodine, therefore it is going to make, what do we care about this one over here, the thiosulfate it's going to require four moles of the thiosulfate. So four moles of thiosulfate. Uh, interesting to note as we move through equations, so for example, when we had here, we initially had one mole of this, which made two moles of this, and then therefore you have two moles of this. It's very common for students to, at this point here, use that two and that one and divide by two. But remember, equations, the coefficients in equations are just the ratio between the, the guys in that equation. They've got nothing to do with how much you've got in a separate equation. Um, two of these were produced, therefore we have two of them. It doesn't matter that there's a big number two there and a big number one there. If you have, you made two of these, manganese, you know, M N O O H O M two, you've still got two of them. So this question, what are the products when molten sodium chloride is electrolyzed? Okay, so um, the cathode in electrolysis is your negative um, anode, um, electrode and the anode is positive in electrolysis. Obviously it's different in other things. So we've got at the negative cathode we're going to have stuff which is positive. So we're going to definitely have... Um, what a, what, a, what a products were molten, so we've got molten sodium chloride, so there's no hydrogen, so we're going to have sodium. So, so the positive sodium cation goes to the cathode, and then at, so the positive, again, it's going to gain an electron and form sodium metal, and then on the right-hand side, the negative chloride ion is going to go to the anode, it's going to give up an electron and form chlorine gas, so two chloride ions will get together and form chlorine gas, hence the answer must be C. 
So this question gives us some E0 values for some half equations and asks us which reaction will be spontaneous under standard conditions. So what we want to have for something to be spontaneous is we want to have um, one of the species from the left and one from, say, the right. And the one from the right has to have a more negative value because if it's got a more negative value, it's telling us that it wants to push in this direction. And if it's got a more positive value, like this one, it's more positive than 0 0.1, minus 0 0.13 is more positive than minus 0 0.45, it wants to push in the forward direction. So these guys would react, uh, Fe2 plus and mm, they would react. Um, but, for example, say we had, say we had, like in the example B, we've got mm2 plus and this lead, they're not going to react because this one is more positive, so it actually wants to go in this direction. This lead actually wants to stay as it is or gain electrons if it was lead 2 plus. And this mm2 plus, it wants to be here, it wants to be it wants to have lost those electrons. So those guys and B wouldn't react. Again, Fe2 plus and lead 2 plus, sorry, and lead. This one for C again, they wouldn't react. Mm2 plus and iron, again, they wouldn't react. But if we look at uh, A, so A's got the iron 2 plus, there's the iron 2 plus, and the MN. So you can see the MM is more negative, so it wants to push that, it wants to lose electrons. The Fe2 plus is more positive than, than minus 1.18, it's minus 0 0.43, so it wants to push in the forward direction, gaining electrons, hence this way we will react, and this is our answer. So in this question, we're told that we got some copper sulfate and that um, it's is electrolyzed using a current of 0 0.5 amps for 30 minutes, and we're asked what mass in grams is deposited on the cathode. So the first step for a question like this is to work out the charge. So our charge Q equals our current times our time in seconds. We're given the time in minutes, so there are 60 seconds in each minute, so I'm going to times 30 minutes by 60 to get the seconds. So hopefully we remember the equation using Faraday's law that the mass deposited at the um, electrode equals Q, which is the current, which we've worked out, times the MR of the substance, and that's divided by the Faraday's constant, which is basically um, how much charge per mole is carried by the electrons, times by Z, which is the number of ions. So let's start putting those numbers in. So we've got Q, so Q is our 0 0.5 times 30 times 60. We've got the MR, they've given it up here, 64. So that's times another 64. Okay, and then we're going to divide by F, that's the Faraday's constant, 9, 6, 5, 0, 0, and times by Z. We can work out Z by looking at the substance, so copper sulfate, you can see how that's copper 2, so it's Cu2+, plus. so how many electrons is it going to gain? Well, obviously it's going to gain 2 electrons, so therefore, um, we can times this, Z will be 2. Now, if you think about this, what's happening here, this down here is the um, amount of current per mole of electrons, and we've got 2 moles of electrons, and up here, Q is how much current was passed through, you know, the current um, this, the current supplied and how long it was passed through. So if we divide this one by this one, it's actually going to give us the moles of the substance. You think about that, it's the current passed through, and this is how much current is um, required for, for two moles. This will tell us how many moles. And then we're timesing that by 64, which is the MR, so moles times MR gives us the mass. So which one does this look like? Oh, it looks like C, so therefore C must be our answer. So this question says, uh, which is propyl propanoate? Is that propyl propanoate? So oh eight means it's an ester, um, and esters are named um, back to front. So it's generally, generally, I mean not always, generally you'll see an ester drawn something like this. So you've got uh, the double bond oxygen, the O, and then you've got the rest of the substance, something like that. So this part here comes from the alcohol, and we name this bit first. So this would be methyl, and then you'd name this bit here ethanoate. So find out where the double-bonded carbon is. So can you see how 
it's actually going to be, these are actually drawn, uh, this one's drawn a bit differently. Actually, that's the carbon with the double bond there, so it's drawn back to front. So that's the carbon there, which has the double bond oxygen. So these parts here are actually part of the, well, the acid. So that would be propanoate. And over here, you've got propyl, so it's OSA, so A is propyl propanoate. This one down here, you can see this bit's the acid bit, so that's ethanoate, so propyl ethanoate. This one here is not an ester, and neither is this one, so there's not esters, so, okay, A. Okay, this question, which could form addition polymerization? So remember, there's two main types of polymerization. Addition, that's to do with double bonds, and then you've got condensation polymerization, so to do with maybe an ammonia and a... Uh, carboxylic acid group or something like that. So we're looking for addition polymerization, so which has got double bonds. So you can see there's a double bond between this carbon and this carbon, so this one is our answer. This one you can see has got no double bonds. This actually could form condensation polymerization. Uh, this one again, no double bonds, no double bonds, yes, so the only option is A. Okay, so it's asking us to start with methylbenzene. Um, so let's draw methylbenzene. So we've got methylbenzene and it says via what can we, which one of these things can we make using electrophilic substitution. So electrophilic substitution, um, you've probably only looked at it via, with sort of things attacking the benzene. So say, for example, we wanted to turn this green one, methylbenzene, into A, that's going to be free radical substitution, so not electrophilic substitution. If we wanted to turn this green one, methylbenzene, into this, we can see that actually for this one, Nothing's actually been removed, nothing's been substituted. This must be some sort of addition. You see there's an H being added on here. If we wanted to turn it into D, we've got to add an ammonia. So um, probably, that's probably a two-step mechanism. Probably first turn it into A, and then you can substitute it with ammonia. Uh, so none of these work, but this one, adding a nitro uh, group, very easy. So nitration of benzene via electrophilic substitution. So we just get concentrated nitric acid, concentrated sulfuric acid. They make the electrophile, and that just adds on via that mechanism, electrophilic substitution. So this next question is asking us, uh, which compound has two enantiomeric forms? So we're looking for uh, which of them can form stereoisomers. So, for something to have to be form stereoisomers, we need to have chiral carbon. And the chiral carbon is a carbon that has four different groups coming off it. So, four different groups. So, let's have a look at this carbon here. So, you can see this carbon here, it's got two bromines on it. So, because it's got two bromines on it, oops, not bromine. It's got two bromines on it, that's not four different things. So, it definitely can't be A. Now, let's go through. Oops, let's try and... Let's look at this one here. So this one here, look at that carbon there. It's got quite a lot of different stuff. So this looks like it's it. So we've got one bromine. We've got one hydrogen, one methyl group. So one hydrogen, one methyl group, and one ethyl group, C2H5. So we can see this one's got four different things around it. So it's got a chiral carbon. Therefore, it will have two different enantiomers. You might be thinking, hang on a minute, doesn't D have the same situation? Well, if you have to draw out D, D's got, yes, it's got a hydrogen, a bromine, and an ethyl group, but it's got another ethyl group there. So it's two things which are the same, therefore it's not chiral, therefore it doesn't show this form of isomer isomerism. So, which combination in the table correctly states the value in units of the gradient? So gradient, gradient, you've got your vertical... Um, length divided by your horizontal length. So you can see vertical length up here is three. So we're looking for vertical length on top. So we can see A, we have A and B. So A and B, O, C and D have, that's the horizontal length. So it can't be C and D. It has to be vertical length divided by horizontal length. Okay, and we can see three times 10 to the, so they both seem to be correct. The distance, what they're doing is they're, um, this distance here, the vertical length they're going from from 3 from there, which is, yeah, about 0 0.6. So those top bits of work, what's different? Well, we can see... Oh, it's just the units. All right, so we're just looking at the units. So let's put... If we put these units on top and these units on the bottom, can you see how moles would cancel? So moles would cancel. dm to the minus 3 would cancel. 
and we'd just be left with seconds to the minus 1 on the top, which means yeah, that would be correct. So therefore, A is our answer. So a quick recall, which technique involves the absorption of radiation by bonds between atoms? So infrared spectroscopy. So that takes in the, um, you throw in your sample, you shine some infrared uh, waves at it, and you measure how much of how much has been absorbed, and it's been absorbed by the bonds. So HNMR, well that's all about sort of magnetic properties of and spin of different um, nuclei. X-ray crystallography has got to do with looking at sort of structures of atoms and molecules. So the sort of basically shine a ray of X-rays and they diffract. So again, not being absorbed by the bonds. And mass spectrometry is all to do with um, propelling particles, well, propelling charged particles at speeds and measuring how long it takes them to get to different places or or if it's the old sort of technique with um, with magnets, sort of looking at how much how they are deflected by different magnetic fields. Okay, looking at question forty. Well, let's just draw in that answer. That one. So, uh, question forty graph shows the concentration of some pollutants in a city over a twenty-four hour period, and then we're asked which of the following cannot be inferred from the graph. Let's mm -hmm. work from the bottom. So, NO two production follows the production of NO. Well, that's sort of inferred, isn't it? You can see how NO and then NO starts to be produced. That makes sense. That can be inferred. Pan concentration increases as the intensity of sunlight increases. Okay, again, um, that sort of makes sense. So as sunrise comes, it starts to increase. An increase in hydrocarbons is caused by the morning rush hour. Well, it is after the morning rush hour, so again, makes sense. And hydrocarbons cause less harm to health than pan. Well, this, I mean, maybe that's true or not, but this graph does, definitely does not tell us anything about health. It just says about concentrations. So just because um, hydrocarbons, more hydrocarbons doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be more bad for your health. So we definitely cannot infer A from this graph. And that's the paper.